Welcome, everybody. Uh, we just finished a really excellent conversation with Nicole Nurian. Nicole is a therapist in West LA, but a little nuance here. She's a former student of mine as well, so this was a really special conversation for me. Nicole, in addition to being a therapist, is also a relationship coach, a yoga instructor, and really spends a lot of time thinking about the intersection of relationships with ourselves and relationships with others as a pathway to overall mental health and flourishing. So great conversation, John. What were some of the highlights for you? Yeah, thank you. I really liked her emphasis on your relationship with yourself being the foundation for all of the relationships. She talked in this conversation about different types of relationships, four different types in particular, and how they're all related. And for her and in her practice, it all begins with your relationship with yourself. If you don't have a good relationship with yourself, then it's extremely difficult. She might even argue impossible to have healthy relationships with others, be it family members, friends, romantic partner, and so on. And she go, went through some very interesting practical advice on this, you know, forgiving yourself, treating yourself as you treat those you love, and cultivating a lifestyle where you do that as a kind of a step towards healthy relationships with others. How about you? Yeah, I, all of that and the emphasis on growth and resilience and really what's becoming a pretty constant theme for the show, which is we should not expect this constant presence of pleasantness, including in our relationships, right? Mm -hmm. So how do we grow as individuals while also growing together, mm -hmm. um, navigating adversity together? And ultimately, uh, she ended with, I think, some really good and practical advice for the flourishing question that's related to all of that. So I'm excited yeah. for listening listeners to dig into that once we get towards the end of the episode. So without further ado, here's our conversation with Nicole Nurian. Hey, Nicole. It's great to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, John. It's good to see you. Good seeing you. How are you guys? I'm doing all right. Thanks. How are you doing? Doing well. Enjoyed learning about your work and checking out your online presence and so on. Let's dive right into the topic. Uh, we like to get right to the heart of the matter when we start a new episode and conversation. So tell us a little bit, coming from your background, education experience, how do you think about human flourishing? Um, so the way that I think about it is it's really having opportunity to make choices in your life and specifically with autonomy. So recognizing that you're able to make change um, I wouldn't really define it as consistently being positive or having like such a happy outlook on life consistently. And the reason why is because it's impossible, you know, so mm -hmm. life, there's always going to be bad things that happen. And what I would define it as is someone that's resilient. So bad things are able to happen, but they can move on. So many people suffer because they're attached to the past or to a situation that happened in the past. So I would say that for me, it's definitely kind of just allowing situations to pass and not linger too long. And then really just having a positive relationship with yourself, which in turn will give you a positive relationship with others. So I hear autonomy, I hear resilience, I hear forward movement, and I, I hear not exclusively pleasantness, right? in your sort of conceptualization, what role does pleasantness play? So pleasantness, the role that it would play is really um, showing us how good things could be, right? So I think, and you don't, you're not able to understand that unless you've gone through pain. Um, and so I think that it's important. It's, it's more of like the balance um, because we're not always going to be happy and we're not always going to be sad and you can't, they're, they're not mutually exclusive, you know, there, mm -hmm. you really need to have both. Um, and then I think that that's why when I speak about resilience, it's not that you need to be in this constant state of um, getting over things or fighting adversity. It's more that when things happen, you're able to self-reflect, maybe see how, where you went wrong instead mm -hmm. of blaming. And that's, and that's what really creates kind of a depressive state for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So a lot of growth, it sounds like to me. And totally. you correct me if I'm wrong here, but what I hear in that is like equilibrium, right? Yeah. Maintaining a certain kind of level or vibe, not, not huge peaks or huge dips. Given that autonomy and resilience seem to be two primary components of how you think about flourishing and probably big 
parts of how you work with your clients. Will you define both of those for us a little bit more? Yeah. So um, autonomy is self-governing. So the choice that you're able to make without inf- outside influences. Um, and that doesn't mean, you know, not thinking about others, but I think that especially in our modern time, there's just so many factors. We're consistently thinking about, well, what would my mom think? What would my boss think? Just my, my friend, my significant other, and, mm-hmm. um, really just having, um, the ability to make those decisions on your own. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of research right now that psychologists are showing um, that autonomy has been viewed as like this key element um, for cultural change as well. And it's really enhancing people's lives to get into self-actualization. And if you don't know what self-actualization is, it's this point of being at your highest self um, in Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And so autonomy it's proven so many times that it has positive affect, like, um, for example, being happy. And then it can also decrease negative affect like depression. Mm -hmm. Um, and then resilience is, it's not the idea that like you go through something and you're perfectly fine. Um, people do very different things with their pain. Mm -hmm. So there is someone that can go through a painful event and they can really, I wouldn't say sulk, but um, allow it to take over. They might become a pessimistic person. Um, They might hurt other people. Exactly. A resilient person, something bad can happen to them and they learn. And it's back to that idea of growth. Mm -hmm. Um, They not only learn, but they may become a more empathetic person. They might not want to repeat things that have happened in the past if there was pain there. Um, so it's, for me, it it would really, resilient would really be defined as learning from bad experiences, um, and being able to move on in a more positive way as a result of that. Okay. So now I think, correct, please tell me if this is correct. I think we've found, uh, one of the linchpins in which the way that these three areas are related, autonomy, resilience, and positive emotion on your view, you mentioned autonomy involves self-reflection on whether you're, you know, really self-governing, you know, your actions or whether you're letting yeah. other people decide things for you, as it were, and, and you're you're letting other people decide things and you're carrying through what they want you to do rather than making decisions for yourself. So it has this self-reflective aspect. And it seems that that's really important resilience because resilience involves learning from what's happened in order to overcome challenges and, and bounce back from them. In turn, to be able to handle things positively and not, for example, be in a long-term state of negative emotion after something. Is that correct? Yeah, totally. Great. So I'd love to double click on autonomy a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> interesting you bring up self-actualization because our third episode is actually with Scott Barry Kaufman, who's literally rewritten the book on it um, oh. and read everything Maslow ever wrote. Interestingly enough, Maslow never created a hierarchy, which is fascinating because I'm sure we all learned it in, in school as I did. Um I think when it comes to autonomy, I often come at this from an educational perspective. The educational literature would would suggest it can be self-governance, but it also can be internalization. Mm -hmm. So you might be doing something for semi-extrinsic reasons, but as long as it is internalized or coherent and aligned with sort of your sense of self and character and who you want to be, that it still can sometimes qualify as autonomy. Does that kind of jive with your view? Totally. Yeah. Totally. Let's talk a little bit about this this notion of unpleasant emotion. A lot of times I think people hear therapy and they go to sort of the traditional view of helping somebody grow, helping somebody heal, which is kind of this conceptualization of fixing the bad, right? Mm-hmm. That there's a presence of unpleasantness and resilience certainly speaks to that. Do you feel that's primarily a lot of your work? Uh, as a therapist when you're with clients or is there a lot of, for lack of a better phrase, building the good as well? Um, I think there's a lot of room to build on the good. And it's, it's honestly, it's a pet peeve of mine. So I, th- I think like whenever there's that, you know, there's always that person in the room that's like, I don't need therapy. Like I'm good. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that for me, it's, 
it's really controversial because I don't think anyone does not have room for self-improvement. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And so I definitely will say that, yes, a lot of my clients that walk in, you know, they usually want to work on something. Um, there might be a stressor in their life that in- initially brings them in, but that's just like the start of it, right? It's not like they... It's so uncommon to really have someone that comes into therapy, fixes the problem, and then wants to stop. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I definitely... I wouldn't say that it's people consistently coming in for bad things. I would say that it's going back to that self-reflection. Um, when you have someone so objective that's not involved in your daily life, it really becomes this opportunity for you to see yourself in an objective lens, which is so rare. And I think everybody needs that. That's where coaching comes in too, I think a little bit as well, yeah. whether it's a therapist, a coach, a mentor, but I love the way you phrased it, just somebody to objectively see things from a different perspective and maybe suggest some action steps. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I definitely think that it, it helps you kind of reach like your potential, you know, and it doesn't need to necessarily be, um, your potential in one category, but like just understanding like, where can I do better? What's not working for me right now? Mm-hmm. You know? I'm in, state, I'm in state A. How do I move to state B? Yeah. Yeah. So let's dig a little deeper on this thing because fulfillment of potential is key to pretty much all of the major theories of flourishing. And I think fulfillment often has two strands to it when we talk about flourishing. You have fulfillment of potential. You also have fulfillment in the sense of life satisfaction. Often mm-hmm. there's quite some overlap between them. So when you talk about fulfillment of potential or, or striving towards your potential or getting closer to it, at least in the case of therapy and what you try to do with your clients, where are you trying to get to when you speak fulfillment of potential? What strands does it have to it? Um, I would say it's, honestly showing up as your best version. I think that you can show up, you know, you can show up to your job, you can show up as a child, as a parent, um, significant other. And it's kind of asking yourself, like, are you really doing the best that you can? Because people can at least walk away from situations, um, more like, you know, more positively if they know that they had given it their all. Mm -hmm. Um, And so for me, fulfilling their potential isn't being the best at it. So it's not like being the best teacher in the room or being the best parent. It's that they did it to the best of their ability. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, some, some people, I think, especially recently, but like, there's kind of this, I think, especially seeing it after COVID, we're not really reaching that point anymore. I think people are exhausted Mm -hmm. and tired you know? Um, and so, yeah, just going back to that, it's, it's definitely being the best version of you, not comparing to other people. Right. So there's a significant subjective element to this then it's performance potential means you're at point X and you should be striving to get to point Y and your role as a therapist is to help them get to point Y where point Y means being the best version of themselves. Is that right? Yeah. 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 And, And Nick mentioned our interview with Scott Barry Kaufman recently, and he really focuses on the idea of growth rather than flourishing. He prefers that as a, a kind of mm-hmm. the, if you like, the ultimate aim of life or the ultimate aim of what he works on partly, which is self-actualization coaching. And he was connected this often with Abraham Maslow's work. So would you say that your your role of your role as a therapist and in your view of flourishing, what you're really trying to do is help the client to grow, but it's not towards some objective measure of this is what it means to fulfill your potential, but rather grow towards being the best version of that particular person, how how, how good they can be. Yeah, because I think that setting like a, an objective standard is what would cause someone to be in distress, you know? Um, and so I think that that's where, at least in my work, therapy becomes so in, individualized because it's, I mean, we're not the same, you know? None of us are. We have so much in our past, our, our traumas and even down to our cultures, ethnicities, et cetera, that just, we're not the same. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I definitely think that, that 
growth and my role in that is specific to them and their lives. Mm-hmm. And I, that's not something that happens after one session. You know, you really have to get to know somebody over time and understand what, what really is their best. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And this connects quite nicely with another interview with Todd Cashton, who's an individual differences researcher, you know, at his, in his focus and was really laying emphasis on this importance about the individual differences between people as vital if we're going to understand what it means to flourish as an individual. Nick, I take it you wanted to come in there. Well, see, yeah, it seems that coming back to our initial question, what you're describing is flourishing as a constant process, not a destination, right? Mm-hmm. Which speaks to one of the comments you made about even when clients, quote unquote, finish their therapy, they, they want to continue, right? Because this is an ever evolving sort of thing, right? That makes a lot of sense to me. Um, the idea of individual differences, and there's really no piece of science that just applies to everybody in the same way because we are so diverse. And there's different models of flourishing that have been studied globally that seem to suggest there's, depending on which model you look at, maybe eight to 10 sort of like general ingredients, right? We'll often talk about what's your individual recipe. Um, I'd be happy to have you speak to what you feel some of those ingredients are, but we absolutely want to double click on one of them that seems to be the single greatest predictor of well-being worldwide, which is the quality of our relationships. Mm -hmm. So maybe if we treat that in two parts, just eventually we'll double click on relationships. What else do you think is really important to a flourishing life for most folks? I think people need purpose in their life, you know, and, and that means something different to everyone. Um, what they're passionate about. And I, I know it sounds so cliche, like, you know, work and something that you're passionate about, but I, the consistent thing I see even with my own clients is that they're so unhappy if their jobs are making them unhappy. They don't feel like they're doing something. They're making a change. Um, and so I would definitely say that career related um, problems are causing people a lot of negativity in their lives. Yeah. Um, And then other than relationships, I would really say um, kind of like taking care of oneself. Um, So like what food people are putting in their body, how much they're moving, um, especially with like so much technology and, you know, we don't, we don't get to move a lot. Um, And so I would really say like, I don't know what to categorize that as, but I guess like in how active you're you're being um, every single day would definitely contribute to that too. Well, one of the predominant models out of UPenn, PERMA, has sort of been adapted a little bit to add a a six letter, and that's often seen as a V or an H, which is health or vitality. And part of what I hear you describing is feeling vital, right? Whether that's sleep, nutrition, hydration, movement, those sorts of things. Yeah, yeah. In terms of relationships... It's easy to talk about them as a as a broad general category, right? But there's clear subcategories. Would you walk mm-hmm. us through some, like what those subcategories might be and tell us a little bit why they're so important to a good life? So it usually falls into four categories. Um, the first one being career related, and that would be your colleagues, your coworkers, or your boss. The second one is friendship related. So that's your friends, your companions. The third is family, so anyone that you're related to. And the fourth is your significant other, so someone that you're in a romantic relationship in. Intimacy. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so they they all definitely contribute to, I would say, ultimately one's happiness because when I mean, your work environment, maybe it's something you do every day, assuming that you're working like a normal um, work week. And so the relationships that you have with your coworkers or with your boss, it like the ideal situation is that it's positive um, so that you can, you know, go into work and feel happy about that. Um, and then friendship, it's it's having people that you can talk to. Um, you know, as human beings, we're consistently craving like socialization. Um, and so that can be new friends, old friends, but definitely people that you're able to talk to and kind of go through life with. Family, um, the way that it, I would say that, you know, f- for a plethora of reasons, but like family can really contribute to enhancing one's life um, is that it's it's very much, and, and again, I'm talking about an ideal situation. Sure. Um, 
It's very much like this, you know, this pack of, um, it should be ideally a lot of trust there and tradition based on culture and et cetera. Um, pass down lessons, religion, whatever it is that, you know, someone is experiencing within their family um, and also just someone to take care of each other. I think that's where family comes in more, especially the relationship between child and parent. Um, And that's actually why, you know, so much childhood trauma is usually between child and parent. Um, And so to have a positive relationship with either of your parents can truly, truly like affect the outcome of so many things that happen later on in your life and in your romantic relationships. Um, and then can I jump in real quick? Cause, yeah. and, and I want to, we'll go down the whole thread on intimate relationships. Cause I think you have really almost a whole nother career yeah. about those as well. Um, it's interesting to hear, you know, language like positive and ideal situation and juxtapose that with the notion of resilience. Right. And I wonder what that looks like. Cause I imagine part of what you would say is you want to have these bonds, this psychological safety, this trust, and it ain't going to be there at all moments every day. Mm -hmm. Right. So tell us a little bit about that. How do you conceptualize that balance or that synergy? For example, like in a strained relationship with a family member, the way that I would define being resilient is I have a, I have a case um, where There are, so these, these parents had gotten married about like 22 years ago. Um, and they're, the dad has two kids. Um, he has a daughter and a son and the mom, sorry, the wife had a previous daughter. And so they both had kids before they got married. Um, and very similar situation. The um, daughter of the wife had zero relationship with her father from a very young age. Um, He was not present, just really not the best situation. And then on the other side with the husband, he had his son and his daughter who um, parents probably got divorced around age 12 or 13. Um, And both parents are present in their lives at this point. Um, They grow up you know, uh, years later living completely different lives. So, um, the two kids of the husband become very resentful. Um, they, they don't, they completely separate from the family. They separate from their friends. They become very, um, almost like self-pitying and into very deep depressive states, very pessimistic states of mind. And then you'll have the daughter of the wife who never had only one parent present um, and becomes, according to people around her, a a very good daughter, a very good wife, um, becomes very in uh, in tune in with her work and um, lives a much more positive aspect on life. She had always said in session that I never want to make anyone feel the way that my father made me feel. Um, And then you'll talk to the opposite side and, you know, they'll say, well, my parents got divorced and pretty much like my life sucks and they haven't tried to change anything. Um, And so where that resilience comes in, and this is exactly what I was talking about before, is that people do different things with their pain with their childhood trauma. So when there is a strange relationship in the family or with your friends or, you know, just a bad experience that happens, the resilience comes in when you're able to take the pain and make something positive of it. Hmm. Post-traumatic growth. Yeah. If it's all the way to trauma, but either way, it brings us back to growth. Yeah. So are we talking, we're talking a long are we only talking a long-term process here in connection with what Nick just said about post-traumatic growth? Is it because my immediate thought was it would be that plus kind of a reframing exercise too, that you experience the pain and perhaps quite immediately with certain cognitive reframing exercises, you can see an opportunity for growth in there or see a way of interpreting this that can enable you to gain some feedback that's useful for your own self-development and so on. So it's quite an immediate way in which 
I'm not sure we would call that resilience really, but a, a way of reframing it to kind of prepare you for the growth. Or are we just thinking this in terms of resilience enables you to gain long-term, grow long-term from these negative experiences? That's a really um, good question because I I wouldn't say that resilience is immediate. I actually would say that it it comes after, mm-hmm. after that reframing. Um, Mm -hmm. and so, and you're so right. Like that is definitely the immediate response that would help someone reach that area. So I wouldn't say that like, um, resilience is exactly what you just said, where it's like, you go through something then immediately you're resilient. And that's why you're able to be like from A to B. I actually think that you reach a point of resilience when you're already at Stage B. Does that make sense? It makes, yeah. yeah. Sorry, Karen. Nick. Well, I say it does. Be, and it's ironic we're having this conversation because next week we're talking to Dr. Karen Rybich, who's the director of resilience training at UPenn's Paz Psych Center. And I know some of the ways she's sort of altered her conceptualization. I've heard this from other people. We used to say resilience was bouncing back from adversity. And the word bounce sounds like it's immediate, like you hit rock bottom and you go right back. And now I hear more people say navigating. And that's where my head went as you describe some of those distinctions. Yeah, yeah, totally. I agree with that. I mean, can can we go a little further on this? Because it seems that there is certainly a skill, character strength, that if it's not resilience, it's certainly related to it, that is quite immediate. So, you know, imagining the soldier at war who facing gunfire, let's say, or sees his or her friends, you know, be shot down and immediately you know, recovers and continues, you know, striving to survive in that versus mm-hmm. um, the person in that situation who becomes immediately terrified and, and can't go on. Now, we want to say that the person in the first case, there's something they possess or some kind of character strength they've developed that enables them to very quickly continue Perhaps that's resilience. I mean, and connected with that, the way I like to define resilience is in terms of two strengths, robustness and adaptability. So adaptability being this bouncing back aspect that Nick's just mentioned that maybe we should actually describe in terms of navigating difficult experiences. The robustness is kind of like the the muscle aspect of resilience you build over time. And so you you, you become more resilient such that when something happens that before it might've taken you a day, a week, a month to to recover from, you've gotten so used to this that you can just, you know, carry on immediately. Anti-fragility. Right. So maybe that's a better way of describing it. Would you not describe that in terms of resilience, Nicole? Um, so in the example that you just gave um, for with the soldier, I, I actually view it as fight or flight. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think in that situation, he fought. He chose to fight. Um, and I, and so I think that that's actually like consistently what's happening with us and it could relate to resilience is what people do when they're met with a bad situation is if they're going to fight or flight. Um, the fighting would be what you just said, like using it as like this muscle of, okay, how are you going to keep going? Um, and that immediate response of like, okay, this situation just happened and like, how do I move on. And, mm-hmm. um, flight I think is actually what brings people to a depressive state because they never really deal with it. You know what I mean? So can we ask about that? Cause when I hear fight or flight it makes a lot of sense. And I think fight or flight suggest eliminate, get mm-hmm. rid of the thing that's causing the perceived threat emphasis on perceived. Right. So that makes me link to something like acceptance commitment technique, where it's more like acknowledgement of what's there and the ability to navigate despite it. Right. As opposed to eliminate it as you might do in a reframing activity. Right. Is this part of what you will work with clients on as well? Sort of acceptance commitment and thinking about it a little differently. Yeah. Um, I think it definitely depends on the client. I, yeah. I do definitely practice radical acceptance um, depending on if I think that the will situation... You, will you define that for our audience? Yeah. yeah. Please do. Um, so radical acceptance, it's a um, it's a psychological notion that you just fully accept the situation as it is. Um, 
you're not trying to change it. You're not like, there's, it's, it is what it is and accepting that so that you're able to then move forward. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's practiced a lot, especially in cases that don't, that are in the past, but also don't seem like there, there's much change there. Um, and, and then the reason why it's so effective is because people really become so distressed and depressed because they focus so much on a specific situation that some of the times that they really can't change. And they'll, that's that place where I'm talking about people will stay in Mm -hmm. and not move out of. Um, and so do I use radical acceptance in my practice? Absolutely. Um, and I would say that the times where I do use it is when, for example, let's say somebody has passed away, um, or there's, you know, there's so many years have passed by, um, there's such a resistance to it that it, it it can't change. So the only thing that you can do is either stay in that place of resistance, which causes so many negative emotions or accepting it and being able to detach from that and move forward. So that's fascinating. I want to ask a little bit more about it and then we can come back to that fourth category, which is intimate relationships. I think it could be really easy for a listener to confuse radical acceptance with suck it up and deal with it, right? Mm -hmm. Which I know is not what you're implying. But if we go back to say like a tough situation with a parent, an abusive spouse, like something that's causing trauma in an interpersonal relationship, how might radical acceptance play out there? Um, And how is it not just, well, accept it and and sit there and deal with it or sit in it, right? Because ultimately, there's still some element of change, I think, if they're in a situation that is actively causing the trauma. Does that that make sense? Yeah. Um, So that's that's honestly a really great question, um, because some people do view it as that, that it's just like suck it up and move on. Okay. Um, I would say that, you know, the the difference is, is that you're not saying that it doesn't matter um, by accepting a negative situation. Um, I think it's accepting what you can't change, um, which is different from saying that this shouldn't affect you and it doesn't matter. Right. Okay. So now I'm getting a firmer grip on what's radical about radical acceptance. So maybe there's two strands to it. Is what's radical that you're having to accept things that you can't change, which can be extremely difficult if we take, say, you know, trying to help someone overcome death anxiety. Can't change the fact they're going to die one day. And is there's that aspect, but there's also the other aspect, which it seemed to me accepting things that are extremely difficult to accept. So you gave the example of bereavement, Nicole. Are there those two aspects that make radical acceptance radical? Or is it just one of those or something else altogether? No, I would I would say that it's both. Right. Yeah, I would say that it's both. Okay. So there's kind of a, a stoic aspect to it, accepting things that you can't control and living in a way that reflects that. Yeah. Coming back to that equilibrium. Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting sort of tension because it seems to me that that potentially could lead to kind of, you know, apathy. Or, or passivity on mm-hmm. some level, like a failure to act in the face of something causing harm. Yeah. And again, that's why I would say it's so specific. It's not something that I necessarily love to bring into practice. Um, I more come through things from either a psychodynamic or a cognitive behavior therapy outlook, um, sure. because I think that there are they're more empathetic. Like you just, like, you know, it, they definitely are. And I, and I think that, um, that's why I, t- I take things as such an eclectic approach. I, I don't use one theory for every single client and it's for this exact reason. Um, because there's definitely cases where radical acceptance, um, can come off as yeah, apathetic and so mm. forth. Mm. John, you want to take us back to intimate relationships? As Nick emphasized earlier, relationships are shown time and time again in well-being research to be the greatest predictor of well-being over time and therefore the greatest predictor of flourishing over time. You 
uh, an expert on relationships, which kind of relationship do you, th- is, is there a kind of relationship you think is most important for our well-being over time? And if so, which one? Absolutely. Um, so it's actually one I didn't mention before, and it's the relationship you have with yourself. It's been shown time after time after time that this is the type of relationship that is most highly associated with life satisfaction. And it's not talked about enough. Um, I I know it sounds like it sounds pretty cliche, but your relationship with yourself really does set the precedent for the relationship you have with others. Um, and that's for a lot of reasons, but most of the reasons why is because the way that you talk to yourself, the things that you tolerate in your own life is what you in turn will tolerate from someone else. So if you're not speaking well to yourself, if you're being down on yourself, you will accept more relationships that are doing the same to you. However, if you have this positive relationship with yourself where you're able to make mistakes, you're able to take care of yourself, you hold yourself at a high standard, you end up kind of like shedding off people Mm -hmm. that aren't on that same frequency as you. Um, And that's why I would say that it's incredibly important because Mm -hmm. it's a reflection for the rest of the relationships you have with the external world. Okay, so is would you argue that a person's relationship with themselves is kind of the the foundation stone on which they navigate other relationships too? And if that isn't really firmly in place, it's very difficult to have healthy friendships, familial relationships, romantic relationships, and so on. Yeah, totally. Because it's it's like how do you know? You know, how do you how do you know if you're being loved or if you're being taken care of, if you're not even able to give those things to yourself, you know, and that's a lot of the reasons why people actually end up in toxic relationships Mm -hmm. is because they tolerate you, you tolerate from other people what you tolerate from yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's why I would say it really does set the precedent for how you're going to have other relationships and whether they're going to be healthy or not. Yeah. Okay, so what does a healthy relationship with yourself look like then? Because, I, <laughs> I mean, just to go on, because we can describe this for other types of relationship, right? We can describe, I mean, maybe not exhaustively what a healthy relationship with one's sibling looks like. We can certainly describe what unhealthy relationships with one's family members and friends look like. And we can give a pretty clear definition of certain things that it means to be a, a really good friend, right? Mm-hmm. So what would you say it is to, to be in a really good relationship with yourself? Um, I would say it requires a lot of forgiveness, um, forgiving yourself for mistakes. Um, and I would say it's taking care of yourself. And, and where that really applies is self-care. Um, so whether that means going, what, whatever it is for you, but like whether that means going to the gym or um, working on yourself being a more empathetic person towards yourself um, and really being able to spend time alone, Mm -hmm. um, I would say is creating that positive relationship with yourself because some, I mean, some people don't, they don't even know how to be alone Um, and really recognizing like what, what are the qualities that um, you have and, and affirming that. So I think like having a positive relationship with yourself includes those positive affirmations and um, really holding yourself accountable to reaching that potential that I talked about earlier, that you're being the best version of yourself. And so what kind of practical steps then do you work with with your clients or recommend for our listeners to cultivate this kind of healthy relationship with oneself? Um, So for example, in like romance, if I have a client that's coming in and is like unhappy with her romantic relationships or his romantic relationships, I'll kind of ask them like, okay, well, what is it that you want in a partner? And she'll, let's say it's a really simple example, but like, well, I want him to buy me flowers. Mm -hmm. And I'll ask them, I'm like, have you ever bought yourself flowers? And they'll be like, no. I'm like, okay, I want you to do that this week. Um, And so I think that it's kind of like doing things for yourself that you would want to experience in others. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. I'm just trying to see. So I can imagine that would, that would be helpful. I'm, but I'm, I'm trying to, see, yeah, I'm trying to move from there then to see that there would be this direct way in which one would support the other. So they, they want to be bought flowers by their partner. So they buy flowers themselves. 
And if their partner doesn't keep buying them flowers or doesn't start to, I can I can I worry the situation might get even worse because they're buying themselves flowers and no one else. <laughs> You're totally right. right. So I'm, Let I'm me... trying to then build this as to then imagining in your case, and you say to them, and this is how this will help you cultivate this kind of relationship and will impact your romantic relationship in a positive way too. Right. Okay. So let me clarify what I was saying. I'm not, um, sorry, I'm not saying that someone is already in the relationship and they want their partner to do something. That would be a uh, communicative issue that I would definitely work Mm -hmm. on with them. What I'm speaking of is when someone kind of comes into my office and they're single, let's say, Mm -hmm. and they want certain things from their part, their future partner. Um, I really emphasize giving that to oneself um, because you don't, you won't accept the flowers can be, it's a very simplified example, but you won't accept certain, um, behavior from other people. If it's like, you're really taking care of yourself. Does that make sense? And so like where I say that the positive relationship with yourself is so important is like date yourself, Mm -hmm. you know? So Mm -hmm. if, if flowers make you happy, if um, going to the beach makes you happy, like learning how to do those things on your own. So that in turn, when someone comes into your life, they're not the happiness. They're adding to happiness that's already there. They're just a, they're a factor. Okay. So can we pull on that thread? Because it seems to me there's this pretty interesting irony here where you hear all the time, you can't depend on other people for your happiness. Right. And that's what I hear you saying as well. You can correct me yeah. if I'm wrong here. And at the same time, we've said it a couple of times, the single greatest predictor of well-being and flourishing is the quality of your relationships, right? Can you get into that nuance a little bit more for us where you would be able to cultivate this relationship with yourself, but also cultivate these four categories of relationships with others in ways that are synergistic as opposed to potentially in tension with one another? Um, okay. I just want to clarify that if that's okay. So you're, you're asking how, how to balance between the two. It might not be balance. It might not be equal, right? But on the one hand, we're saying relationships are critically important. I think all of us are aware of frankly, the really alarming science around loneliness, for instance. Yeah. And at the same time, we talk a lot about loving yourself and self-care and self-compassion and those sorts of things. And I'm trying to tease out how the two can not only coexist, but reinforce one another. Yeah, I actually, I love that. Um, I I definitely think that they can coexist. What I would say, though, is that... Um, that the really I would I would think about the relationship with yourself as a foundation first. Um, and then once you, you know, you kind of have that established, then I would allow it to coexist with your other relationships. And um the way that that would happen and the way that you're able to learn and kind of have them bounce back on each other is um, you know, you might have a situation where there's someone who doesn't treat themselves very well and um Maybe they they're not into self care, but they have a relationship with someone that, and they're seeing that. And that's where we learn, you know, or um, whether that means that a friend or a significant other all of a sudden starts doing things for them that they've never done for themselves. It might, you know, turn something yeah. in their brain, vice versa, or it doesn't even need to be um, a partner, or et cetera, doing something for you. You can even be inspired um, by other relationships that you're seeing like, wow, okay, this person is taking care of themselves or they are very ambitious and working hard and you're able to be inspired and then kind of take that in into the relationship that you have with yourself. Um, and I mean, that's honestly like the most beautiful harmony you could think of um, mm-hmm. is learning from both sides and allowing those two to really flourish like that. Bi-directional, right? Like it's all part of the same ecosystem. We don't flourish in a vacuum. We don't feel good in a vacuum, right? And you you can see this in all sorts of different lines of research, whether it's self-efficacy, excuse me, self-efficacy, the Pygmalion effect, all these different ways in which the presence of others impact your thoughts and beliefs about yourself, right? Yeah. 
So, okay. So there's this foundation. I like the term John used is sort of like foundational stone, if you will, that is intrapersonal, right? So your relationship with yourself and you've laid out at least mentioned four interpersonal categories mm-hmm. of relationships that are really important. We didn't necessarily get to tease out um, some of the elements of an intimate relationship, which I know is a particular area of specialization for you. So can we go down that path a little bit, talk about why intimacy is so important and some of the things our listeners should consider for a good, high quality, healthy, intimate relationship? Yeah. Um, so I would say something that's really important in an intimate relationship is companionship. Um, so really when you're entering into a relationship with someone, make sure that they can be your friend so that, you know, those, so these categories sometimes will um, bleed into each other, but the two categories that bleed the most into each other is the friendship and the significant other. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's because a lot of those qualities that come from a friend, such as somebody to listen, someone to talk to, someone to experience life with and make memories with, those are all important things when it comes to having a significant other. Um, and I would say that, you know, um, it's something that I think about a lot is there your significant other. It's really, it's such a special bond because it's really between you and that person. And it's a choice that you're making consistently every day to commit to that person. Um, and so I would say that the happiest relationships come from two people that are equally committed and that's where um, the like rare thing is to find is someone that is showing up with equal effort um, as you are every single day. And sometimes, you know, someone kind of has to carry a little bit more and, and um, et cetera. But I would really say that it's um, finding that alignment with the person that you're with. And that can be in so many different categories, whether that means your hobbies or your passions, um, your personalities even. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say really contribute to that. And um, the reason why our intimate relationships are so important is because it's actually where we feel the most oxytocin, um, which is also known as the love hormone or the love drug is like another word for it. And people it's our happy hormone. And so like when we are with our significant other, whether that means being sexually intimate with them or whether that means hugging them, um, we release a lot of oxytocin. And this is a necessary hormone for us to feel happiness in our lives. And that's why a lot of times when people are single or lonely, like they can end up being in these really depressive states. Okay, so I'd like to connect this up also with some of the key areas you mentioned earlier, Nicole, such as resilience and growth, fulfillment in the broader sense, fulfillment of potential, but fulfillment of your being your best self. How do you think cultivating this relationship with yourself and cultivating this strong, intimate bond can help with those kind of areas? Maybe not all of them. Maybe it can't so much help with resilience, but can it? Yeah, it definitely can um, because your partner... Um, a lot of times in the best types of relationships, they're kind of a a reflection for you also on those traumas, the shadows that, you know, people don't really want to talk about. It comes up a lot in those romantic relationships. And I think that's where there's room for that self-reflection and that self-growth is having someone to go through that with you Mm -hmm. um, and also challenge you. Mm-hmm. Um, to face that, you know, um, and I, I, it's definitely very different from the relationship that one would have with their therapist, but in turn, it's that mirror reflection of, um, having such a close relationship with someone, especially being vulnerable, which is so important, um, to maintain a good and healthy relationship with your partner, um, allowing them to help you and, not necessarily need to like fix anything, but someone that kind of allows these, you know, these traumas and these insecurities that come out. That's when it comes out is in the relationship is our insecurities. Most of the time Mm -hmm. is in our romantic relationships. Um, And seeing that as a, as a time for self growth. Why am I feeling insecure about this? Why is my childhood trauma coming up right now in this romantic relationship? 
It's, mm-hmm. it, it's interesting hearing this connection is good question by John between resilience and these, these growth and relationships. I don't know if you've, you know, read any of Kelly McGonigal's work or the upside of stress or seen her Ted talk, but you mentioned fight or flight earlier, right? Fight, flight, or freeze one response to adversity or stress. She argues there's two others. And one of them is tend and befriend. She talks about how the body is biologically primed during moments of stress to reach out, to get support or give support. And I just wonder how that interpretation jives with what you see in the world of relationships and resilience. Um, I think that there needs to be an equilibrium of that and there needs to be a consistent... Um, get and give is what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, get and give. Um, I mean, that's why people get frustrated in their relationships yeah. if one feels like they're getting and one <laughs> like they're not giving or except, you know what I mean, et cetera. Um, well, isn't that the sci- basically the scientific definition of loneliness? Like there's a gap between needs or perceived needs and wants and what somebody's actually getting. Yeah. And it causes, I mean, it causes so many negative emotions, resentment, and, you know, anger, like, um, and so I would definitely say that in a healthy relationship, you're, you're having both, both are mm-hmm. happening. It's not this cat or mouse game. It's, it's very much the happiest relationships include giving as much as you're getting. Mm-hmm. So we recently spoke to Arthur Brooks, a happiness expert, if you like, and he he made a, in some ways, a similar point to one of the points you just made that he talks in this book from strength to strength about the kinds of relationships we should cultivate throughout our lives to have long term well being throughout our lives. And he talks about romantic relationships, the strongest kind, the healthiest kind, being what he calls companionate relationships, ones that mm-hmm. have at their very foundation strong friendship, mm-hmm. and they're romantic as well, but. The point being that their foundation isn't passion. So he talks about how, you know, data on how passionate relationships often end quite quickly. The ones that have at their foundation stone friendship tend to last longer term. Now, given what you've said about one's relationship with oneself, I'm wondering if, because you seem to share this view with Arthur Brooks, correct if I'm wrong, but that, that kind of relationship is the healthiest kind for intimate relationships, one that really is, is friendship is the, the solidifying force between intimate relationship. What I'm wondering is, how cultivating this important relationship with yourself, which you you know argue was the kind of foundation stone for all relationships, could help in turn make you more skilled at cultivating companionate relationships. Is there a connection you see there in, in your work? Yeah, there totally is because I think in order to have a relationship with yourself, you have to be your own friend, right. you know, um, and that comes with being compassionate towards yourself and empathetic towards yourself and um, even like simple things like entertaining yourself, being able to do something with yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, I always tell people like, what do you like to do alone? Mm. Um, And a lot of times people can't answer that. (laughs) It Um, sounds like you're distinguishing between companionship and codependency. Am I misinterpreting that? um, I wouldn't say that it's codependent to want to do something with someone else. Nor um, would I. What I mean is like, if that's the only way you can be, like, what if you can't be by yourself? Well, right? I say that that's mm. codependent. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I would. Um, and I, I definitely, I think that the reason why companionship is so important with yourself and then in turn in your romantic relationships is because Um, Like you said, that passion doesn't always stay. And I think that that's a lot of the reasons why people like leave once they um, don't feel that passion and that spark anymore. When, Mm -hmm. when really that's, it's, it was never supposed to be sustainable. Um, You know, what's sustainable is a companionship and a Mm -hmm. friendship. Um, And so I think that, you know, if you can't, if you're, if you're only going towards what meets the eye, you're never going to be happy. Um, and that comes to, to also with yourself. You, you know, your worth cannot be dependent on how you look or if you have, you know, the body or this or whatever it is that um, you want. And I think that that um, bleeds into your romantic relationships because looks fade. Um, you know, you could lose your job and all these things that like me make seem, make someone seem like so desirable. Mm-hmm. Um and that's why it's becoming this common thing where it's not passion between two people. It's that companionship because that lasts. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and it's better to feel centered with someone that you can trust and et cetera, than consistently having this like attraction to them and um, like that spark that isn't necessarily always realistic. There's an interesting connection here that I think brings us back to growth and resilience again, because when you mentioned passion doesn't last, like we have we have good science to demonstrate this, right? I'm, I'm thinking of Sonia Leobormirsky and some of the work she did around hedonic adaptation, right? Couple, newly married couples will return to baseline levels of subjective well-being more often than not within two years. Like the honeymoon mm-hmm. period is a real phenomenon, right? Mm-hmm. So what does that mean to me at least? And, and please feel free to push back, but you've got to grow together. You've got to evolve together in a variety of different ways. Um, it seems difficult though, because in many ways, some of what brought you together um, might not last. So then how are you supposed to navigate um, staying together as you change and evolve as an individual? We talked about the intrapersonal relationship, um, but that's then two people evolving into different versions of themselves and trying to maintain that connective thread. Thoughts or advice around that sort of evolutionary process? Yeah, um, there's actually, there's so much research on this. And um, what I would say is that, you know, when you're entering into a relationship, especially if it's for marriage, um, really allowing your partner to go through those life changes, but also with your support. And And this is why I always say that, It's so important to, um, yes, have a relationship with your partner and that companionship, but it's also why people need to um, have areas of consistent growth, um, places where they can consistently grow. Like you're not reaching this like plateau where like things aren't fulfilling anymore. And, you know, you, um, I always, um, I always say like, I think the most ideal situation when you're getting married um, or entering a relationship is that you're not meeting someone at the height of everything in their life. You know, like maybe it's like the height of their career, the height of, you know, and, and I think the reason why is because that growth is so important and it's so beautiful to watch someone go through that with you. Um, mm-hmm. The times where it becomes a problem is if one person isn't growing and the other person is. Um, and this is why I talk so much about having um, passions different from passion, like romantic yeah. passion, but passion and pursuits as opposed pursuits, to pursuits. Yeah. Um, a hundred percent because you, you really, you can't do life without it. Um, I, I don't, I don't think that you can live completely happy if there's not something in your life that you feel passionate about. And I think that the right partner will want to nurture that. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can see that going into relationships in so many ways, like even before you get married, like how someone supports you in your career or at school or, um, and taking care of yourself and really finding a partner that challenges you and supports you and, um, holds you accountable also. Yeah. And it sounds like you need to have collective growth in a relationship for it to be a healthy one. One person isn't growing, the other isn't, right? It has to be a, a mutual state of growth together and each individual is growing, but together as a couple, they're growing as well. Yeah, totally. And I want to specify, it's like not, not in a competitive way at all. Growth can mean something different to like so many people. And so whether, again, that goes back to me saying like being that best version of yourself. So, Mm -hmm. you know, if someone is going up in their career, one partner is going up in the career and the other um, person, like their growth may not need to be career. It might be, um, becoming more social if that's something Mm -hmm. that they want or, you know, picking up those things. Great. Thank you very much for all these points and insights, Nicole. So for our final question, we like to ask all of our guests what we call, in an entirely non-cheesy way, the flourishing question. What's the one lesson on flourishing you want our listeners to walk away with? And what might be a practical step for putting that lesson into action? So what I would say is to really work on that relationship with yourself. Um, The reason being everything that we spoke about, but really, I truly, truly believe that a positive relationship with yourself will create positive relationship with others. And the steps that you can take towards that is really ask yourself, like, what is it? that I want in a partner or from my family and from my friends? And am I able to give that to myself? And the reason why 
I say that is because if you are able to give it to yourself, every other relationship becomes an addition to what is already there. And that creates such a better lifestyle for you because it's not always going to be positive. You know, your, your family is going to let you down. Your romantic partner is going to let you down. Your friends can let you down. And it's important for you to be able to still provide yourself with those additional things that they're giving you. Um, mm-hmm. And so what I would say is really, you can, it helps so much to even write it out. Um, what do I need in my life to make me happy? What are small changes that I can make every single day that would make me happy? Um, and sometimes you think it's, you need it from other people, but you're really able to see that you can give it to yourself and it's okay to rely on other people for that. But that foundation really has to start from you. Great. Nice. Reflection, journaling. It's a great way to wrap. So yeah. Uh, Nicole Narian, thank you so much. Tell us where people can find you and work with you. So right now I'm working at an office. It's called OK Humans. And it's completely changed the way I view mental health and other people have viewed mental health. So um, the way that it works is that it's a storefront. So people are able to walk in and no one really knows what it is unless you're a patient there. Um, hmm. And when you walk in, it doesn't look like a therapist office. It's very much an oasis and it has turned therapy into a luxury, which it really is. And I'm not talking about price or anything. It's that people should be taking care of themselves the same way that they go to a physical doctor. And this has really made it so accessible. You can walk in. We accept walk-ins. We also can go on okhumans.com. And if you click book a session, you can find a bunch of bios. My bio is there also, and you can book a session. And if we work together, we consistently see each other once a week. Great. And you're quite active on social. Will you drop your handles for the audience? Yeah. Um, so if you guys follow me on Balance with Nick on Instagram, I have millions of views on my videos right now. Um, I talk a lot about relationships, a lot about self-esteem. Um, I'm really big. Um, if you guys couldn't tell already on self-esteem and really creating um, a positive relationship with yourself. Um, so you can find mostly everything about me on that page. Great. So those balance with Nick, balance with NIC. NIC, yeah. We'll share that out and uh, try to send people your way. But thanks again, Nicole. This was a real treat for us. We appreciate your time and your expertise. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Nicole. Huge thanks to all of you for listening to today's show. If you like what you heard, please share it with friends, family, colleagues, and be sure to leave us a five-star review. Uh, You can also find us on all social media platforms. Uh, We've got our own YouTube channel, and you can check out our website at flourishfmpodcast.com. We'd also love to hear from you. There's a survey in the show notes you can complete where you can complete any suggestions on guests you'd like to hear us interview or particular topics or themes you'd like to hear us talk about. We'd love to hear your feedback on that. So your feedback would be greatly appreciated if you could fill out that form. Until next time, thank you very much for joining us today. And keep putting in the work.